Hello and welcome. Uh, here we are for lecture five. So as you can see from the title slide, the theme today is going to be about collections. So, so far we've been kind of been uh, building up our little tiny circuits and we've been doing so kind of one, you know, operation or one register or one input at a time. And it'd be nice if we could do things like, you know, do it for an arbitrary number of inputs or have an arbitrary number of registers, right? So having collections isn't just a way for us to automate things to reduce the amount of typing we're doing, but it's also a way for us to starting things get more flexible, more parameterized. And so we're just going to take an initial first step in those topics today. We're going to come back to these things over and over again and keep learning new programming techniques as well as new features and languages to kind of take advantage of these. But today we have a nice little fun foray in that and to kind of remind ourselves of a broader uh, roadmap for our, our instruction. Uh, so today we're covering collections. On Friday, we're covering kind of a first take on encapsulation, talking about things like defining our own functions, perhaps taking those interfaces we've been putting in a bundle, maybe making our own bundle classes and that sort of stuff. By the end of Friday's lecture, you should basically be able to do uh, anything you can do in Verilog in Chisel. Now, not, there's, there's, there's some things here and there, but for the most part, yes. And already, even at that point, you will have some amount of parameterization and flexibility kind of in your arsenal. But then as it goes forward, going to next week, the week after, etc., we're going to keep cranking it up. We're going to keep having more parameterization, more generation, and more flexibility. So, uh, sorry, I forget this to uh, advance. Uh, continuing on, so I said for today we're talking about collections, uh, known as groups of things. Uh, and so we're talking a little bit about Scala features, as well as a little bit what's going on inside the Chisel world. And we'll see a lot of examples. So today's a great day for you to ask examples or what ifs or how does that done kind of thing. Okay, so, uh, you know, let's go ahead and load in uh, uh, our, our notebook. Great. Um, and so the first thing we're going to work with is what we call a range. This is the thing inside of Scala. And as you know, the name implies, the way to kind of encode a numeric range. So this is really helpful if you want to have specific numbers. And we're going to use this in just a second to kind of define our iteration space for our for loops, right? So uh, syntax in Scala, you know, it has this very almost English readable style where you have, you know, to start uh, and until and then the end. This is exclusive use until, so zero until four is, you know, zero, one, two, three. However, if you want to if you find a word too easy to work with, or maybe you find this math, math, math is either for inclusive bounds, uh, you can use the word too. And of course, you also can change the step size or even do clever things like, uh, you know, reverse the order and have a negative step. So if we go ahead and run these, uh, you can see how they come out. So, you know, Scala has types for everything. So there's even a type for a range and it's, you know, printing out the range. Um, as you can see, for example, where in both of these cases, we're going for the exact same iteration space. But you know, it's a question of are we using a less than, which is until, or a less than or equal to, which is two, to kind of compare the two. Uh, cool. And you can see it normally by default, it goes uh, up by one. Uh, if you want to go up by two or something else, you can do that. If you, of course, if you also want to go down, that's easy. And it kind of once again, pointing out that Scala syntax at work, right? Uh, you know, zero until four is a pretty nice human readable thing. Uh, this uh, should also be valid, right? Uh, and so that's exactly the point. So this up before, we can go ahead and uh, remove that uh, punctuation. This, you know, perhaps much more uh, easy to deal with. Cool. So now we're able to kind of define numeric ranges. What can we do with them? Well, let's go ahead and put them into a collection. Or sorry, let's, let's hang on for a second. Let's go do collection first. So there's a lot of collections in Scala. Um, if you read the you know, change log for a given version, it's always all about collections. <laughs> They're constantly tweaking and changing things. But that's really kind of strength for the program language, right? When you really get going in a large project, you're going to find yourself you know, primarily using their collections. They're great. And you're gonna, there's a lot of functionality built into these collections already. Like if you look at the APIs, which I've linked here for Seek, uh, there's just a zillion methods implemented on a collection, uh, and they're really helpful. And so uh, the collection we're going to use most often is something called a seek, which is short for sequence. And it's just a collection of things. But rather than being a collection of things in any arbitrary order, it's something you've somehow defined it into seek some sort of order, right? So you're saying not just I have, you know, these n things, but I have these n things and there's a particular order they come in. And keeping track of the order is going to be helpful for us because later on maybe we want to make sure we have a deterministic way of kind of connecting to the same things over and over again. Now, if we peek under the hood inside of Chisel, or sorry, inside of Scala, we'll see that uh, Seek is actually uh, like a base class in the uh, large uh, inheritance diagram for all the types of Scala classes. 
And uh, it's, you know, usually not implemented directly. It's usually one of its implementations, one of its, you know, subclasses, right? Um, so there's a lot of different uh, cases, but uh, for us, seek is just fine. We don't need to worry about the exact nuances of do I want subclass A versus subclass B. You can just use seek. Uh, some style guides recommend against it because they think, oh, you should be very careful what subclass you want. We're not gonna, probably going to have seeks that are large enough for it to make a difference. <laughs> and so it's okay. But to briefly uh, mention the types of subclasses you might consider, there's things like list or vector, right? So list, as it implies, is like a, a linked list style data structure. Uh, so the pro, of course, is that it's very good at, you know, appending and prepending. Um, the con is, of course, it's not a uh, great spatial locality and, you know, has a little bit of overhead accessing things. By contrast, you know, you have something like uh, vector, which is, you know, a very much array-like, has great spatial locality, but of course, a little bit more expensive to do things like prepending to a collection or something. And so um, if you really know the details, you look something in the diagrams, you can figure out performance characters and pick the ones you want. But for now, we can just keep using seek and that'll be great. Uh, another thing to point out is seek is immutable. Right. So as we said before, you know, Scala kind of has this desire to have as much as we keep immutable as possible. Uh, so there is an immutable version of Seek. Uh, there's actually also a mutable version as well. So for many collections, there's an immutable version and a mutable version. Uh, but in the default namespace in the, in the language, uh, Seek is bound to the immutable version. And if you want to use the immutable version, you need to specifically import it and, you know, instantiate it differently. But enough boilerplate. Let's go back to the uh, little example here. So, okay, so what do we do? Well, we defined a seek. So we just kind of said, hey, we want, you know, seek, and we gave it some initial values, one, two, three. And you look at what happens, it produced a seek. And actually, the compiler in runtime decided to bind this to a subclass, in this case, list, right? It decided, you know what? Uh, you know, we're going to, in this case today, we're using seek as a list. Um, but who knows, right? It could be perfectly valid for implementation of Scala to use vector. Um, one other thing to notice, if we haven't seen this already, uh, seek is a templated type, it's a collection, and so it's templated on a type of what thing it's holding inside of itself. And so the way you represent those templates in Scala courses would be square brackets. So here we didn't say the type, we just said, hey, we want, uh, you know, a seek and did the type inference. Uh, you know, we could be more explicit about that, right? And okay, that works out. Now, of course, uh, if I, uh, you know, try to say these are strings, Nope, nope, that's not going to work. They aren't strings. Those are ints. Um, okay. Now, what if I omitted that, but then these were not homogenous, right? What's the type inference here going to do? Well, it's going to go find the common uh, super type, right? And so you're asking for int versus, you know, a string. It's going to go find what's the common type between them. It goes very far up the uh, hierarchy of classes. And it comes to any, which basically is, you know, as the name implies, anything. It's kind of like the, you know, super type of everything. Um, so hopefully, usually in your code, if you're debugging it, if you come across a collection or a type that's any, that's a suggestion you're mixing up your types somewhere. <laughs> so it's usually not what you want to see. Because uh, that means, you know, somewhere there's a mixed types. But yeah, if you have just, uh, you know, like I said, all homogenous types, type inference works great, and it works out. And if you want to be extra, extra sure to make sure, you know, it's interpreting things the way you want it to, you of course can, you know, nudge it along. In terms of some common methods, we have, uh, you know, is empty, which, you know, so one of the things I try and do in Scala is be a little bit more verbose, so perhaps a lot of languages might just say dot empty. Uh, here it's dot is empty. Another thing you'll notice is that this is a function call, so I, you know, would put the parens on it. Uh, however, it's actually just a, a trait, right? And so it's actually just a property of it, so you actually don't even need to do that. Um, and rather than, you know, a very common thing in a lot of programming languages, when you want to see something is not empty, you say, you know, dot empty and you put a not in front of it. Well, in Scala, the benefit from doing that, they just have a non empty method as well. That's kind of handy. Uh, and then for length, um, same thing. There's a dot length. There's actually also a dot size. And for a seek, they're the same. So don't worry about that. But, you know, if you want to know how big it is, of course, you can do that. Um, and then there's one other thing which might be helpful when you see this later today is the ability to kind of, uh, fill things out in a seek, right? So if I want to have, uh, you know, multiple things, what I can do is I can say, hey, I want three instances of eight. And it'll go ahead and do that, right? So, so the fill will create, you know, a three element seek filled with these elements of eight, right? So that's what we can see down here, of course. And then 
This is true not only for when we're programming uh, with collections in Scala, but also perhaps in Chisel. At some point you're worried, oh my gosh, you know, what am I dealing with? Am I, which version am I working with? If you ever get a little nervous and you want to double check, <laughs> you can also do dot class and see what you're looking at. In this case, the key thing to look for is the fact this is the immutable collection, right? That's the kind of thing that's default bound in the Scala space. So yeah, so that's, that, that's the seek. Like I said, if you go to a link here, you can see a lot more methods. Uh, one thing you'll find is kind of interesting is a lot of things you might think of that are like really part of the language. For example, when we learn functional programming, you learn about the map operation. Map's actually not a built-in keyword in the language. Map is actually a method implemented by seek. And of course, to have, you know, certain things make it more streamlined, of course, that's the, like inherited as a trait, so that way it's kind of more standardized. But it's actually a method uh, on, on seek. That's why I there's so much emphasis on the classes is because these collections basically implement most functionality we care about. On uh, language as a core is actually pretty simple, uh, which is kind of cool. All right, so we've talked about ranges and seek. So now we kind of have these two forms of things that are kind of pseudo-like collections, right? Range, of course, is a temporal listing of values. Uh, a seek is a ordered collection of things we give it. Um, let's keep going. So uh, let's put these together for, with a four. So, so you know, Scala, like, uh, maybe I'll make that lowercase so it's consistent. Uh, like many languages, has uh, a four capability. Um, and what's interesting about it is, uh, is perhaps more closer to the Python style where you, you know, have a, uh, iterator approach rather than saying, you know, I equals zero, you know, like this is C++ plus plus here instead of an iterator. So what do we do? Well, we bind, you know, a, a variable to, uh, some, uh, iterable in this case, we maybe we're going to use the range. Okay. So yeah. So, okay. What does this little simple example do? Well, we run it and we see, okay, well, we say zero until four. Remember, this is the uh, exclusive, right? And we just, we're just printing it out. Okay, so we had our for loop go from zero to three. That, that, that's not too crazy. Um, now, what if we want to, you know, perhaps somehow move data between uh, iterations? Sometimes that's most easily accomplished using a var. Although I told you, I, you know, I try to avoid using var. Sometimes it makes the code cleaner. We can make code cleaner with a little bit of mutation. Uh, that's maybe not the worst thing in the world. Uh, so even though I didn't print anything out, you know, this, this compiles the runs correctly. Maybe I'll go ahead and print something out, right? If we want to see this uh, before we update it, maybe. Right, okay, it's going to behave uh, kind of as we expect, right? It went from negative one to two. However, if I leave that print, we're going to get run out of space. <laughs> uh, and then, um, actually, maybe I'll just go ahead and, oops. Uh, I think I said there was a question from chat coming in. Oh, the question um, was correctly answered in chat, but I'll go ahead and repeat it in the broadcast for those who, uh, for later. Uh, with the range, the question was, oh, wait, what if I, you know, didn't say by negative one, I just said three to zero. Uh, we're going to get an empty range, right? Because the default parameter for the step size is one, right? So it's gonna, you know, you can imagine the code under the hood is gonna say, okay, well, let's initialize to the start point. Okay, initialize is three. Okay, is three less than the end point? Le end point is zero. So it's gonna say, no, it's not. So I should not continue and it ends them right away. Yeah, so you are gonna need that by uh, minus uh, one, negative one here. Um, it's about to work out. Good question. Uh, great. Um, oops, so, oops, no, 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 no. Go back one more. Great. Okay, so here we are. So here we are now doing that. Uh, what's interesting about these uh, for loops is they actually had to, if you really want to get into it, they had the full power to do like full for comprehensions. So once again, maybe it's something you may experience in language like Python. Uh, a single for loop can actually do multiple variables and essentially the equivalent of multiple nested loops, right? So here, what am I doing? Uh, I'm saying, hey, here's uh, a variable i. We're binding to this range. And then Here's one of those two times you really need a semicolon. Uh, and what we're doing is we're saying, okay, that's kind of, you know, one th thing we have going on. And then we have an other generator, which is now J on a different range. These things don't need to be constant. So in this case, we're doing it relative to I. And uh, we're putting a filter on it, right? So, uh, you know, we can imagine, like, so we, we saw here, some simple for loops over a simple 1D range. Here now with these two generators side by back to back, we've kind of created uh, a nested for loop. It's like we had, you know, four eyes, and then within that, another for loop. But just for conciseness as language, you can write it this way. 
and uh, we put a filter on it. So we said, um, only do this if this constraint is true to two things at the four, right? So this is going to, of course, consider the iteration space uh, of this, right? Now, for example, if I started from zero, this is also going to include uh, three comma one, right? Um, this kind of shows a little bit uh, of what's going on, right? Uh, and so yeah, there's a chat uh, comment saying, you know, okay, you could do something a little analogous uh, in Python for the ranges, how to do the uh, iteration counters in Python syntax shared in the chat. Yeah, so you can see some of these constructs are kind of available uh, in Python when it comes to these ranges and it comes to these uh, four comprehensions, I think Python's probably uh, something that's both a combination of a well-known language that's pretty similar to some of the constructs you're seeing here. Let's take a second and pause for readability, right? So uh, even though the Scala language lets you do this, <laughs> even though it looks pretty spiffy, uh, imagine if someone reading your code maybe isn't, you know, 100% Scala Pro, right? So they're going to see this, and at first glance, maybe when you're tired late at night, you may not recognize that this is um, a nested loop, right? That's, that's a pretty uh, understandable confusion, right? So for example, maybe it's worth uh, writing out the alternative, right? So if instead of doing it like this, uh, if we did it more explicitly, right? Okay, so I might run out of space real quickly, but we'll try anyways. Uh, you know, we're going to do J from I until 4. And then if, uh, you know, I plus J equals 4. And then print line I of J, right? Which maybe the inner loop I'll finally not put the parens on it. Um, okay, so that should be equivalent. I'm going to remove that so we have space on the screen. Oops, we forgot a 4. And yeah, we get the same result, right? So uh, this is more verbose. However, perhaps, uh, you know, less surprising to somebody reading, especially somebody maybe not a Scala veteran. And so it's kind of a, it's a general practice when writing code, although a given language has some really, really cool features. If those features are kind of perhaps less common in other languages, be aware that readers of your code may not be familiar with them. So uh, this is something maybe I'll leave as kind of a decision point or something to consider. That's why I kind of have this moment where I kind of pause for readability. I'm not trying to say hard and fast rules of like never do X or always do Y, but just consider certain things. And so the common pattern you see throughout programming is that language has a really cool nifty feature. You're really excited to use it. Uh, however, you know, someone else reading your code may not be super familiar with that exact feature of that language, right? And most people reading a lot of code sometimes are only perhaps passingly familiar with that code. And so uh, this is one of those things where maybe you kind of think twice about, but uh, you know, we, we put it out there. Um, cool. So you can see side by side, right? Where yes, this is really concise. Technically, you know, even if you put these on different lines, you can do that. But you know, maybe for a little bit of readability, it's better to put it separate. Uh, cool. Questions on this so far? Okay. Uh, we'll uh, keep going. So, uh, what happens if we oops that uh, use these inside of our code? So what this loop uh, is doing? We get something called a delay line. Basically, we're just going to, given a hardware signal, it's going to come out of the end of this module n cycles later. And what's cool is we're saying that n is parameterizable, right? Uh, and so uh, what does that going to look like, right? So it's going to be a register feeding into a register, feeding into a register, feeding into a register. And the number of registers we have in that sequence is going to be equal to how many cycles we want to delay. So how does that turn out into our code? Well, we're going to need one register for every time we want to delay. So if we want to install n cycles, we want, uh, you know, n registers. Okay. And then, so how are we declaring these registers? Well, we're declaring as a Scala collection. And this is something you're going to do a lot. Is you can use Scala collections not just on Scala variables. You can use Scala collections even on chisel objects, right? So in this case, we're instantiating a bunch of, you know, registers. In this case, they're bools because this thing is built for a bool type. But, you know, we could do it differently if we wanted to. And we're just instantiating these reg, right? Okay, and we want to use that fill construct to get n of them. So at this point, this regs uh, is a collection, you know, a Scala seek of chisel reg. Okay, and then what do we do? Well, we can uh, access elements of this of a seek with just um, parens, right? So this is the the indexed lookup, right? So I want to say in element zero. We're gonna go ahead and connect that to our input, and then. For uh, every, um, for all but one of the elements from one to n, <laughs> we're going to connect it to the previous one and then we're connect the output, right? So 
here we have a little tidy um, loop, and this should, uh, you know, give us what we expect, right? So if you want to delay by two cycles, for example, what's it going to do? It's going to declare two registers, and then, you know, here's our non-blocking assigns in Verilog, right? Um, if we want to do it by zero cycles, oops, that, sh oh, there's a minus one here. <laughs> um, that's not going to work there. So you can see already there's a lack in parameterization in my code where if somebody wants us to go away and have a zero cycle delay, uh, as written, that's going to cause an issue because it's going to become a negative index, right? Um, so it's kind of maybe a thing to think of in the future is how to make this more general. Well, right now, I guess I should probably, you know, require n to be greater than one. Uh, oops, sorry, greater than zero, I wanted to say. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have trouble. Um, but you can imagine maybe kind of to have that ability. But in spite of that, you know, here we did, you know, one cycle. So there's, you know, one reg, you know, we of course can have it do it five cycles and there'll be five regs declared. And so that's pretty cool. So we've already kind of done something that's, you know, uh, pretty parameterized. If you're a super Verilog ace, you're probably saying I can do this with a gen bar. Probably could, but we'll come, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll come, we'll come to uh, some more complicated examples in a few minutes. But cool, I'm going to pause for questions on this one so far. Okay, well, I'll keep going. So uh, here's one way of writing it. This is, you know, pretty nice where you have, you know, uh, seek is immutable. And remember, we aren't actually changing any of the, the Scala, but we are connecting these chisel objects that already exist and using kind of the Scala execution to kind of go through them and connect them all. Uh, we could actually, you know, perhaps consider using a var. How might this look, right? Um, so what do we do? Well, uh, we just, you know, are using this var to kind of remember the last thing we need to connect to. So remember in the prior slide, we, um, uh, oops, on the prior slide, uh, we were um, uh, doing this minus one indexing. Uh, over here, uh, you may notice that we aren't even uh, using a seek, right? Uh, so we are, you know, every iteration of this loop, we're making a new register. We're using that reg next feature to kind of give it the input, the time we construct that uh, register. And, this goes through. So I believe this one, unlike the prior one, should be totally happy with uh, a zero cycle delay, right? So that worked out just fine. Because um, this, this for loop doesn't exist, execute, and so we're connected the input to the output. So we want to do zero, no problem. We want to do one. We're going to get all this other junk for, you know, the registers. But you can see the registers were uh, instantiated right there. So yeah, so this is kind of um, an alternative. And although we kind of said, oh, we want to avoid var, in this case, I think between these two, I kind of like this var one a little better. I think it's a little bit um, uh, easier to kind of see things, uh, what's going on. And also, as you saw already, this handles the case of, uh, you know, zero cycles much more gracefully than the version we just saw, which perhaps you might solve an if statement or something. Uh, and we'll cover some more things uh, in the uh, coming weeks of this course about how to do things with functional programming uh, to make this kind of a smooth thing. But right now, the kind of contracts we've taught you, I'm trying very, very careful to make sure we're Showing examples that only use features we've covered so far. Cool. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll keep going. Uh, so uh, another type place you may want to use for loops, especially right away, is in a tester. So if this problem looks familiar, yes, it is. This is from the lab that was due uh, last night. And so we, you know, I gave you this little tiny module, uh, you know, just doing a little combination of logic, and then we asked you to exhaustively test it, right? And so to exhaustively test it, uh, you know, we, we knew that, you know, three binary inputs, so that's going to be uh, eight combinations. So yeah, it wasn't super fun, but you probably wrote out, you know, uh, eight times the number of pokes and expects to kind of capture all the cases. Um, and probably some of you were wondering, is there maybe a, a more elegant way to do this? Uh, and then he, he, here's an example of that, right? So um, what are we doing? Well, we are using seeks, you know, to find the possibilities. In this case, we're considering, you know, true or false, right? Uh, in this case, rather than doing that, you know, for comprehension style, perhaps it's maybe easier to kind of wrap our head around it if we, you know, write out each loop separately. Great. And then um, we're poking in those values, right? And those values we're casting to uh, bools, right? Uh, one thing we're doing here, which is a thing we're going to kind of keep developing, is sometimes there are testers. It's nice to have... Um, a Scala code to kind of the same functionality, right? So when you're testing or checking something, you want to know compared to what. 
Now, in this example, maybe it's so caref- uh, trivial, maybe perhaps you did this whole lab problem, you may have solved that balloon equation by hand and known what the values should have been, uh, and just kind of hard-coded it in there, but perhaps maybe we can go ahead and write that logic equation using the proper Scala, and then we can kind of compare against the Scala thing and have it solve it for us, right? And so now in this case, what we're doing is, that's what we're doing. So we have, you know, our, from the combination of these loops, we're going to try all eight combinations, right? And then we have the Scala we're expecting to compare that to what we, what we want to see, right? So if we go ahead and, you know, run our tester, uh, you know, uh, we are printing out, oops, let's just get that to kind of up here. Yes, we are printing out the kind of cases. We can kind of see them there. And that's, that's all pretty good. Uh, let's, let's, let's consider some variations. Like, I think it should be possible to actually, if you want to perhaps do it kind of more in binary. Oh, that's not going to work because it's not been cast uh, for the expected line. So as structured, it's probably better to have it uh, with the true and false because you, otherwise this line is not going to work out. That makes sense. Um, but maybe you might find other things that might play out nicer. Uh, meanwhile, one thing I did include here, that's why I just want to comment things out. I want to try and cover this common question that comes up is, okay, let's go back to these prints. Remember we had print line for things in Scala world, printf for things uh, in chisel that's only activated during simulation. Let's kind of see how it behave, right? So in particular, we're using a print line, in this case, not in the module, but in the tester. So this is going to be run during a tester during simulation while we're testing. And you know, it has kind of expectation behavior we expect, right? You know, for every... Uh, you know, time we poke, we print something out. So, hey, we try, you know, true, true, true. We try true, true, false. And we see what's going on. Um, okay. Let's not do it that way. What if we instead try to do this with a uh, chisel printf? Okay. Let's do that. So, if a chisel printf, we just ran the same thing, and we only got one line of output. And you're probably going, like, what gives, right? What did, what did I do wrong? Um, well, what happened is uh, we actually still poked eight different cases in here. And after each combination of pokes, we still did do the expect operation. But the printf semantics are prints the printf once per cycle. So actually, because we did things effectively instantaneously, right? We said, you know, we change the inputs and then look at the output, change the inputs, look at the output, and didn't really let any actual time pass in terms of cycle granularity there was no like actual time passed, right? So for example, if I actually, instead of doing this all you know, in zero cycles, instead if I did this uh, over you know, eight cycles, then all of a sudden we get the behavior we expect, right? Because now uh, every time there's a, you know, a printf, the printfs are gonna be you know, applied every um, cycle, right? So now we're running for multiple cycles, and then there's a chance for this printf to take advantage of that, right? So, um, this isn't always an issue. This comes up more often if you're testing out a combinational module. One nice thing about combinational modules is sometimes it's feasible to um, exhaustively test them. And I just wanted to kind of give this a little brief uh, point out this detail about printing just so it's not a complete surprise when you come across this where, yes, when you poke a value, the peak post tester is going to you know, expect combinational logic to immediately update itself. Of course, if those poke values are invisible once they go to register, that's not going to be visible until you advance time with the step feature. But let's say you have a purely combinational block and you're you know, trying a bunch of values and expecting things and trying to also print things out. Perhaps maybe it's simpler if you either advance time so you can get these printfs, you so advance one cycle per test case, or even though it's not really necessary technically, or you maybe do the printing uh, in Scala land. So that was just a little brief uh, comment about the printing and so you'll have a surprising point later on when you try this out. Maybe I'll pause again for questions. Cool, okay, so then we can advance. So um, let's talk about chisel vec, right? So we talked so far about using seeks to kind of hold things in Scala as a nice collection. We've talked about using for loops to iterate through things in Scala, but what if you actually want to um, do uh, dynamic addressing in hardware, right? And that's where vec comes in. So uh, kind of following a lot of the other chisel collections where it takes the Scala name and kind of truncates it. That's the chisel version to kind of distinguish the two. So we saw, for example, Scala, it's a Boolean. In chisel, it's a bool, right? Or in Scala, it's an enumeration. In chisel, it's an enum. Here we have, in Scala, it's a vector. And then here, it's a vec. However, uh, one thing that comes up a lot when people are learning chisel is make sure you understand when you need a vec and understand that most times you think you might need one, 
you actually are just fine with a Scala collection or like a Seek, for example, or uh, actually a full on, you know, Scala vector, maybe for whatever you're using. Um, and that's why I actually made a very careful point to show you earlier in this lecture today to show you examples where we can use Scala Seeks to build things up and recognize that Vex, although extremely helpful, uh, you know, there's a lot of times you actually don't need them. You can get by just fine with Scala collections. And so there's really kind of two times you want a Vec, right? One is to dynamically address things saying, hey, I want to, I have some number of things and I want to, while the circuit's actually made, you know, to actually pick one of those. That's dynamic addressing. This is usually done by MUX, of course. And then the other thing is if I want to parameterize the number of ports, right? If I want to have some arbitrary number of ports and kind of give that flexibility, that's going to be also uh, better done with a VEC. Okay, so um, let's look at this tiny little example on the right. So no better example of dynamic addressing than using uh, a VEC to implement a uh, MUX, right? So uh, what have we done here? Well, we're going to go ahead and run this. Uh, we've used a VEC for um, this input, right? So rather than just being, you know, a uint, it's a VEC, right? And so what's the VEC syntax? The VEC syntax is number of elements, comma, type, right? In this case, we're doing a uint of a specified width. We decided to parameterize that for fun. Uh, okay, so we have some number of inputs here. This is variable, right? Uh, and like a typical MUX, right? We have, you know, select signal to kind of choose them. And then our output. And then to actually access the element, it's that same array indexing style syntax in Scala to use uh, rounded brackets, you know, the round parentheses. And so it's simply just picking out of it. So you can imagine if you're, you know, a designer, you probably wouldn't even bother to make a, a model just for a mux like this, but it's a great example for us to kind of show this in practice, right? So, you know, here we have a, a, a four-way mux. Maybe I'll make it just a uh, two-way, right? And so now we see it using that, you know, ternary operator, just like we saw previously in the selecting, that makes total sense. Now, one other thing to point out, as we saw in the prior lecture, we're doing a little bit of cleverness about determining our bit widths. So if I have, you know, n things, I need log base two of n bits to address what I'm selecting from. So that's kind of what we're doing here. And so in this case, for example, we say we only want two things. It knows how to select only needs to be one bit. You know, if we make it go back up to four, it's going to go ahead and make that two bits, right? And so one thing that comes out when you actually look at the variable submitted by Chisel for VEX is not only does it use MUXs, it uses kind of a long linear sequence of MUXs where you think, okay, you know, uh, if I'm building a four to one MUX out of two to one MUXs, I would need three, right? Like kind of like a tree structure. It's actually going to use four, right? So what's it doing? So <laughs> it's, it's lining them up like this. And this might seem a little, you know, inefficient or verbose, um, but it's actually okay. Right, and the reason why is that uh, you're expressing semantic behavior, pass this off to any CAD tool, and you're not just the great commercial tools, but even the cheap, or I should say free open source ones that are just getting started, still do a good job understanding what this is and doing the right thing. Um, and so it doesn't lead to unbalanced or inefficient hardware. Uh, but it does allow us to have kind of um, simple design tool flows, although the Verilog is less readable than we would like. And this is one thing they're trying to fix with the language. Um, but cool, okay, so we built this, you know, arbitrary number of things. You can make this, you know, arbitrarily big. Maybe I'll do, uh, you know, seven. We'll see it, you know, have, of course, more and more of these muxes. Uh, but cool, so we've uh, used the VEC in this case, uh, both for its dynamic addressing ability, as well as uh, parameterizing the number of inputs. And we can just keep going with this, right? So uh, here's another example of using a VEC to parameterize number of ports. So we're also, once again, using it in the input category. It's a kind of a common thing to do. So what's this reducer module? This module is given uh, n uh, uints and just adds them up, right? So there's a little uh, reduction on them. So in this case, we're taking that VEC and we are um, using them to collapse uh, it down to a single value, right? So we're going to go through all the elements and then we're going to add them all up and uh, see what we get, right? Um, and you may notice that we are once again using a var. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes var and for go together pretty well. We'll learn some functional program tricks in a week or two where we can not use a vars. But for what we've covered so far, this is kind of a not unreasonable thing to do. And so, for example, if I want to just, you know, give in two inputs, and I can reduce the two things, right? So if I have two inputs, you know, this vec, when it's elaborated by the chisel tool flow, it's going to, you know, plug in two and turn this into two right here. Of course, if I had a, a bigger module, 
uh, it's going to go ahead and, you know, appropriately, um, you know, add more ports as well as continue to build up this adder chain. And so in this case, we're using a VEC, but we're using it with a static index. And so what I mean with static index is an index that's fixed at the time the tool is elaborated, right? Where yes, you know, if you look at this code, this I is technically a variable just, you know, set by this for loop. But remember that the Chisel program, the Scala program runs, produces some, you know, IR nodes, and those are later turned into Chisel. From the point of view of those IR nodes in the design graph for the circuit, those are constant things. It's going to be run with, you know, access zero, access one, access two, access three. So then downstream, those tools can totally, you know, inline and flatten those out like we're seeing here. And we also should be able to say, I want to do just one element, and that should work just fine. Yeah. So here we've already gotten a little bit of flexibility, right? Now we're saying, hey, I have this thing where you give me, you know, n inputs and can be anything greater than zero. Uh, I don't think it's going to behave too gracefully if we make it zero. That's probably why I put the require and let's see what happens. Uh, yeah, because we never assigned total so far. So we need to have at least one input, right? Uh, yeah, so that's probably, <laughs> oops, sorry. Uh, this one I should undo. Same, same issue, right? Uh, uh, oh, we can't do access of zero something to zero long. That makes sense. Yeah, so once again, that requires statement uh, was, you know, well, well chosen. Um, great. So we can kind of see some things we do. So one of the things you're kind of doing when you're designing your generators, right, is to kind of think about what inputs does the tool support and what inputs is it reasonable for me to even try to support, right? And so in this case, um, if somebody wants to reduce zero things, you know, that's a little bit of a weird thing to ask. Uh, you may find sometimes the generators, it's good to handle those seemingly odd uh, corner cases to have other things kind of flattened out and simplify well. But that's kind of a, a little detail. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, very quiet today. Very few questions. Okay. So that's, that's Vec. Um, so we'll keep going. Uh, so one other way you might use Vec, actually, wait, I'm going to, yeah, we'll, we'll go into sort of, I might go back in a few slides in a second. Um, so what if you want a read only memory, right? Or a ROM, so to speak. Uh, you can do that with uh, a Vec, right? In particular, there's another Vec uh, feature called Vec init, where you can tell Vec, uh, what values it should have to start with, right? And so... Uh, what are we doing? Well, here we're building a little interesting module. What it's going to do, it's going to have a lookup table. So we're going to do some computation, save the results, and then uh, put those results into a table in the hardware. And in hardware, whenever we want to do computation, we're actually doing computation. It's just going to go ahead and look it up in the table, right? So we're basically memoizing something. But the memoization is happening at design, you know, elaboration time. And then we're encoding this lookup table into hardware as we're doing this example, right? So in particular, for this tiny little example, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, let's do a lookup table for dividing by x, right? So take some arbitrary integer, which we can give at the time we're generating this module. And what we're going to do is going to say, hey, for any input up to four bits, right, from 0 through 15, we'll cache the result of it. So I, of course, could maybe have parameterized those other more variables. Maybe it might be hint what's coming in homework. Um, let's see what we're doing. Well, uh, vec init takes a seek, right? So we need to give it a, a sequence of the results we want inside of our vec. Once we've done that, you know, we're calling this a table. Of course, just to look things up is easy, right? We just say, hey, look it up. So thus, the, the interesting question is, what the heck is going on when we're populating this seek? Um, well, let's think about it. Well, we kind of want to go through and uh, go ahead and fill it in. So you can maybe imagine a lot of other programming languages you might just declare a mutable seek and fill in element by element. Here we're doing it a little bit differently. We're using uh, a immutable seek, right? Which is a standard seek or immutable, but we're using a mutable <laughs> reference to it, right? Um, so what's happening, right? So what we're saying is, hey, we're gonna start off with an empty seek and then we're gonna keep appending to it. As the syntax is here, I'll come down in just a minute. We're going to keep appending the result. And what's the result? Well, we're tracking, is it evenly divisible, right? So evenly divisible, we're seeing, hey, is that current number we care about? You know, modulus our x, which was given to us. Is that zero? Does it evenly divide? And um, for that, you know, of course, we're converting that to a bool for, for, for chisel, right? And so what we're doing is uh, we're taking the old value, which is a seek, appending it. So this operation is, you know, immutable seek appended by this new element. The result of that is another immutable seek. 
However, we're able to overwrite this results variable because the results variable itself is a bar. Once again, you know, if you're, people are perhaps a little bit perturbed by the like, four uh, uses of var and four, we'll cover functional programming instead in a week or two. But uh, for now, this is kind of perhaps the easier way to kind of think about it. So we're building this up element by element. We're basically continuously appending it. Now, with the continuously appending, you're probably a little worried about, oh, is this inefficient or something? But uh, number one, for small numbers, it's not so bad. Uh, number two, for lists, they usually can do these kind of prepend depend operations very efficiently. That's kind of one of the nice features about them. Um, so about the appending operation itself, this is an interesting uh, Scala quirk. Uh, for uh, appending uh, things, they have multiple syntaxes, right? So if you want to append uh, two sequences, it's usually a plus plus. And now if you want to uh, append an element of sequence, right? So this is a type of a collection. This is a type of an element. Uh, this is the syntax they came up with, which is kind of interesting. It's colon plus. You may be wondering, well, what's that for? Well, the colon kind of in a way represents, like, you can think of it pictorially as like multiple boxes or blocks. So that's kind of like the collection. So that's the side that goes with the collection. And then the plus is the thing you're adding, right? So uh, in this case, okay, that works fine. What if I reverse the order of these two things, right? Uh, and put the results on the other side. What's it going to tell me? Doesn't like that, right? Uh, because it's basically trying to, you know, do a append operator to a bool, and that's not going to work. However, uh, if I put the colon on the side with the collection, that will work, right? Because that's going to be on uh, the prepend operation. Uh, however, uh, for this application, that's probably going to be the wrong semantics. Uh, <laughs> we need to probably change our iteration range. So I'm going to go ahead and reverse that back. Uh, to what it was before. Um, and so part of why, you know, seeks are so commonly used in this kind of list mentality is you can imagine if we weren't doing a for loop and instead doing recursion, which is next week, uh, this might more gracefully fall into recursive ways describing hardware. Um, but that's kind of results. So we went through the effort to develop this seek and we put this into uh, a vec init. And yeah, it's, a, it's basically just a nice read-only table. So we defined it. We can go ahead and look at it. Um, and so what happened? Well, as I said before, under the hood, vex often get turned into uh, muxes. And the results of our uh, table, because it's read only, are all these literals, right? So what kind of what's happening is, of course, there's a uh, you know, literal at the lowest level. And then what do you do? At the next level, at Gen 2, you're looking um, back and either considering a new thing, if it's true, or considering as old a prior one. So it's kind of this big uh, unbalanced mux tree. But it's all in there, and we've done the functionality, right? And so, yeah, we've encoded a ROM. You can imagine this is pretty helpful sometimes to be able to uh, kind of encode things. OK, uh, if there's no questions on this, I'm going quick, to quick go back to the issue of registers, right? So uh, going back a few slides, uh, VEC seems really cool. What if you want to do uh, VEC and REG together? Um, the way to declare it is a reg of vec, right? Um, you can't do a vec of reg, which uh, this is one of the things the language has gone back and forth on a few times. Uh, you can look at the link uh, for the most recent uh, rationale on this uh, debate. Uh, basically, the way it's explained currently is that vec is a type, not unlike a uint or a essent, versus reg is a uh, like object, right? So there's kind of difference between a type versus like an instantiate, like an actual component. And so, yeah, so you can have a reg of type vec. So pragmatically, if you want a bunch of regs and you need to use vec rather than a Scala collection, which you already saw earlier, you're going to declare it like this. Now, uh, as you see in this other slide, if you eventually need to initialize those registers, perhaps you want to use reg in it. And inside that reg in it, you're going to use a vec in it to give it those, uh, those values. And that vec in it, of course, can be a seek. So basically what that you could do with that combination of a reg in it wrapped in a, sorry, reg in it wrapping inside a vec in it uh, inside a seek, right? That way you kind of have um, that set up. OK, cool. So uh, we can keep uh, going if there's no more questions. So let's talk about a mem. So. Uh, mem is a chiseled construct for memory. Uh, so it's something that's you know going to go in hardware. It's dynamically addressable. 
and it's mutable, right? You know, the, this hardware, you know, other operations can override it, right? The the ROM we just saw in the prior slide wasn't a special contract for a ROM. It was just a VEC that we gave uh, literals to, so that way they were, you know, not changeable. Um, and so uh, with the mem and chisel, we just kind of were saying the semantics, how it behaves at a cycle level granularity. What it actually turns into in the real hardware is going to depend on the back end, right? So today we're going to look at some of the Verilog outputs, but even how those Verilog inputs are interpreted by uh, a given CAD tool will vary, right? So depending on the details, you know, what you know we're calling it a mem, which perhaps in your mind might be a keyword for like an SRAM or a DRAM, it might actually get turned into registers or on an FPGA might turn into a BRAM or it might not turn into BRAM depending on the, the details. So uh, what, what, what are our details? If you use the keyword just mem, what you're getting is something that is combinationally read, meaning if you give it an input, it'll give you the output back without a cycle delay, it'll give you back to, you know, obviously there's some real world delay, but in simulation land, there's effectively no delay. Uh, however, the writes don't happen until the end of the clock cycle, right? So it's a synchronous write, asynchronous combinatorial read. Um, and these parameters are tweakable, right? So if you know, for example, especially if you're targeting a certain memory technology, you know, I need to have a two cycle latency or something, there's a way to override that. Um, this is so common that there's something called a sync read mem, which has a one cycle read delay. So this is perhaps a very good uh, proxy to use for something like an SRAM or VRAM, where basically, you know, you give it a read address, give it an enable, and you have to wait a cycle, and then you get the data back a cycle later, right? Um, so it's one cycle for read delay, one cycle write delay. So that's sync read mem. Um, when it comes to using these, this chisel is actually pretty flexible. You can uh, declare memory ports both implicitly or explicitly. And if you want something like a write mask, we've only want to, you know, so you have, you know, uh, a 256-bit word is your chunk inside of your memory. If you only want to write, you know, a small section of it, perhaps you're doing like updating a single word within a cache block, you can do that with the write masks. Additionally, there's ways to be very clear that you want something to be a read-write port, because especially with memories like SRAMs or VRAMs, uh, you know, perhaps there's a situation where you're it's not just a write port or a read port, you want a read-write port, a read slash write port, there's a way to kind of specify that as well. So we're going to show a couple examples of these in a couple of the coming slides. So uh, let's talk about uh, doing uh, a simple example. So that's kind of a favorite fun example. Uh, we're going to build a registry file, like the kind you might find for your architecture class for building, uh, you know, uh, a processor, right? So a register file, right? Remember, we want to have some number of registers, and we want to be able to read them, and also be able to write one of them, right? So maybe a typical RISP processor might have two read ports and one write port, and so. Here's our uh, interface for that. It's a little bit verbose, right? We have to have an address for what we're reading. So the zero address, the one address. And then when it comes to writing, we need an address. We don't always want to write. We have to have a write enable. And we also have the data we're writing. And then what's the output? Well, the output's going to be uh, the, uh, you know, things from the two reads, from read zero and read one. Uh, I kind of put in, you know, parameters here that make sense for, for example, maybe making a 64-bit risk I say for each two registers, right? And so what do we do? Well, we have future registers that are each 64 bits. Boom, we declared that mem. And then how do we go about uh, reading them? Well, we simply are just doing this, right? We have that same indexing syntax and we make a connection, right? So we say, hey, this, you know, R0 out gets the result of accessing uh, R0 address and R1 out gets access the result of accessing R1 address. And then for the right, we can put the memory on the left side and then we can go ahead and uh, you know connect the, the right data, but we only want to do that when the right enable is on. If the right enable is off, we don't want to change it. So you know if, before you go and plot this into your you know RISC V processor design, you might need to add a little special case in here for how to handle register zero, making sure it always stays zero. But other than that, this is you know pretty concise and uh, nice little compact thing we built here. Um, so let's go ahead and you know push this through the tools. So we go ahead and do that, and then we go ahead and look at the the Verilog, and what do we get? Well. Uh, you know, the interface is what we expected, right? That's not parametrized. Um, but uh, there's a quite a bit of detail here. So what's going on is that uh, under the hood, when it's instantiating all the Verilog, it is really doing quite a bit of work to try to uh, have all these fields. And some of these fields are trivial in our current example. And so they're going to get, you know, properly optimized away by the CAD tools downstream. 
But I think the thing to kind of keep in mind uh, is that if you look at the uh, ports, basically this is the memory name, the port, the first port's a read port. So yeah, you know, it's taking in the, uh, the read address and then the data is gonna be, of course, Ver looking this up. So the keeping of notice is when you use the mem. In the Verilog, it's actually used a Verilog array, right? So that's this thing up here, so, right? So that's a Verilog array. Um, and so, yeah, so it's what we expect, right? We made an array of registers. We are accessing into that array using the Verilog dynamic indexing construct. Uh, and then the write, you know, of course, uh, depends on the, the enable and, you know, it has a non-blocking assignment to actually, actually have the write happen. So um, the Verilog is not pretty, but it's doing what we were hoping it would do. Um, if I perhaps didn't want to use the mem construct, instead did this as a regevec, which is, should be totally legitimate. Uh, in terms of what hardware is actually emitted, it should be effectively the same. However, we're going to see the Verilog in just a second is going to be not quite the same. So the Verilog, what's it going to do? Well, it's going to declare, you know, one reg for every reg, right? It's going to do for this entire, uh, you know, vec. And then, um... Because it's you know choosing between very two things, you're gonna have very two muxes to try and select from them all. Um, so, uh, although a regevec is sometimes the right thing, uh, mem, despite the name, uh, by default is a you know asynchronous combinatorial read, right? And so, uh, combinational read, so not combinatorial, combinational. And so, mem maybe keeps your life a little simpler. That's fine. Uh, and of course, if I made this a sync read mem, which we talked about, that's now changing semantics now. Instead of data being available, data is available a cycle later. Uh, and so that's, that's going to change the Verilog in a material way, right? It's going to change this in the resulting hardware. And I think the key thing I want to kind of highlight is, yes, you can see now that, for example, uh, the read addresses are no longer accessed directly, but instead they go through this, you know, cycle of pipelining um, through non-blocking assignments. Um, cool. But so that's kind of a little detail. The, the big picture is, yeah, this is a mem, right? So mem, we can go ahead and, you know, instantiate. And uh, if we want to read it, we read it. If we want to write it, we write it. So it's actually pretty nice and straightforward. So this mem, zero cycle delay for reads, one cycle delay for writes, that kind of makes sense for like a register. If you want something closer, maybe like an SRAM, you probably want to sync read mem, but you may be kind of constantly fine tuning which these mems are using and the parameters to kind of make it better match up with your tools. Whew. Okay. Um, for one, a uh, little more additional wrinkle. Uh, here we're using the implicit ports, which I think is a very nice syntax. Uh, sometimes folks maybe want to be very deliberate about what they're doing. Uh, you can also use explicit ports, right? So it's the exact same setup. Just now we are saying, hey, I definitely want to do a read or I definitely want to do a write. Um, this is especially helpful when you want to be uh, extra robust about like a read write port. If you have exclusive one conditions, it should recognize it's a read slash write port. But if you want to be extra sure you can do this. Um, okay. So yeah, so of course you can imagine running through this and then, uh, you know, getting the output. Great. Um, let's actually if I go back a slide. So here, you know, for, for building a processor, you can imagine, yeah, it's a processor. I know for sure in a processor, I'm only going to want to have exactly two read ports or something. But what if you want to build a superscalar processor and then all of a sudden you want four ports or eight ports? Um, how am I going to make this more parameterized? Well, you can imagine we would, you know, factor uh, these together into a vec, and then we could go through that vec uh, with a for loop and then have the connections. So uh, maybe I'll go ahead and do that right now on the fly, and we'll see if I make a mistake. Um, okay, so we'll call this read address. It's of type input. It's going to be a vec. Uh, we should say... Uh, number of read. Okay, it's going to be however many uh, read ports. And then uh, uint64. Uh, Great. Uh, so that's our read addresses. We no longer need to have that, right? We are going to need to have an read out, right? Our, yeah. And that's going to be an output, which is going to look a lot uh, like this. Maybe I don't have space for all those extra spaces. Uh, I think I need one more paren. Yeah, I do. Great. And then, of course, 
uh, how would this work inside here? Well, uh, I wouldn't, of course, do that anymore. But now I would just do for, uh, you know, we can just say I, for lack of better variable, uh, zero until number of read. Uh, and then we can connect uh, the output port to uh, reading uh, the input port appropriately, right? And so uh, that's going to be happy, but now it's going to want here. So if we put in two, sure, we got the same design we had before. If I put in, you know, uh, one, we can see it perhaps getting a little simpler. <laughs> but I could also put in uh, eight, and maybe we're going to regret this. But yeah, we can see, for example, with the VEX and our IOs, right? We now we have parameters in the reports. And, you know, we've, we say, hey, we want eight read ports. Okay, so fine. We need to take eight read addresses. We need to take, we're going to produce eight outputs. And then, you know, yes, the chisel tools did a bunch of work to kind of flat out the stuff out. But, uh, you know, here it is doing the assignments and using that uh, Verilog addressing feature and boom we did it right so if a little bit of tweaking i'll probably move this to a separate slide and make this more clear <laughs> um we've done it so cool um questions on this okay with that in mind i want to give a brief uh update on some of the course uh assignments kind of keep everybody on track and then we'll be done early so uh for the assignments so uh last lab one was due uh last night so thanks everyone for doing that uh, we're going to try and push lab two out, hopefully, um, either in tonight, if not tomorrow morning. And I'll be doing, of course, next Tuesday uh, night. Uh, homework one is uh, still due uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I think there's a little, some chatter on uh, Slack about, you know, getting help about uh, installing certain tools or asking questions about the problems. Please go ahead and use the Slack as a way to kind of not only give help, but also get help from your colleagues, right? So uh, especially for doing things like tools or understanding the problem assignments, we're going to try our best to staff to help out. But... We're also very appreciative of students helping each other on that Slack for the course. And yeah, that should be that. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, always contact me. With that, have a good day, folks.